It is November 10th and this is The National. We begin with a number of major stories developing in the nation's capital tonight. We are coming to you from the National War Memorial in Ottawa and on the eve of Remembrance Day when Canadians will be reflecting on past sacrifices, CBC News has learned exclusive details about Ottawa's plan for the future of today's troops. In a dramatic move, the government appears to be changing the face of Canadian peacekeeping. The CBC's Murray Brewster is breaking this story for us tonight. And Murray, what can you tell us about Canada's uh, plans to, that they'll be announcing next week? Well, Canada's going to be hosting a high-level ministerial meeting on peacekeeping in Vancouver. The Liberal government intends to offer up a list of high-level equipment and troops that it can hand over to the UN for specific peacekeeping missions. But what it's not going to do, however, in Vancouver the next week is commit to a specific mission. That's something everybody's been waiting for. So let's contrast this to the original peacekeeping pledge that the Liberals made in, in 2016. Well, in the summer of 2016, the Liberals promised to deliver 600 troops and 150 police officers for UN missions. Now, the UN's been anxious for Canada to make a decision, offering us up big roles in missions in Mali, the Central African Republic, South Sudan, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. What this new announcement will mean is that deployments, when they do eventually come, will likely be smaller and highly specialized. Think of transport planes and helicopters as opposed to soldiers and tanks. And a lot of those specialized skills are going to be in demand, like bomb disposal and training for other UN peacekeepers, particularly women. You know, peacekeeping obviously has been so important to Canada, so important to past Liberal Prime Ministers. So why is the government going down this different road instead? Well, peacekeeping has changed, and it does not look like the peacekeeping most Canadians would recognize. It's more dangerous, it requires long, multi-year commitments, and there's a fear of getting bogged down. And the ghost of Kandahar is probably haunting a lot of the deliberations because Canada wasn't expecting to get stuck in a long, costly guerrilla war in Afghanistan. And a lot of countries today are involved in intractable conflicts where there's no peace to keep. All right, Murray, thank you very much. You're welcome. The other big story in this city tonight involves the finance minister, Bill Morneau. After spending weeks in a cloud of controversy, we've learned he is now under investigation by the Ethics Commissioner. Mary Dawson confirming today that she is officially looking into the case. The big question here whether there was a conflict of interest when Morneau sponsored a pension bill while still owning shares in his family's pension company. David Cochran is following that story for us tonight. And, and David, uh, what more can you tell us about this investigation? Yeah, you know, really all has to do with Bill C-27, which is that pension reform bill that critics say if it passed, Morneau's family company, Morneau Chappelle, could make a lot of money because pension administration services is one of the big things that it does. But the issue isn't just that family connection. It's the fact that Bill Morneau or owned a million shares in Morneau Chappelle at the time he tabled this bill, and they weren't being held in a blind trust. So the Conservatives have asked for an investigation. The New Democrats have asked for an investigation. Mary Dawson is giving them an investigation. And, Ian, this means the two most most important people in this government are now being investigated by the Ethics Commissioner, Bill Morneau for Bill C-27, and Justin Trudeau for his Christmas vacation on the Aga Khan's private island. And, and take us through what the Finance Minister is saying. Yeah, he sent me a statement shortly after this news broke, and Bill Morneau's office says he is promising to fully cooperate. He said, this is in part what he said, since the first day in office, the Minister of Finance has worked with a conflict of interest and ethics commissioner and will follow her recommendations and advice. The minister will answer any questions the commissioner has on this matter. And Ian, we should point out that Morneau has followed Mary Dawson's advice to the letter on how he should handle his personal wealth, and he still ended up in this mess. Now, he has taken other steps to clear his name, promising to sell those shares in Morneau Chappelle and donate those profits to charity. That's five million dollars potentially that he's prepared to give away to clear his name in this. If Dawson finds wrongdoing in this investigation, she can fine him some more, only 500 bucks. The money wouldn't be the problem here for Bill Morneau. It would be the fact that he's being named and shamed as violating the Conflict of Interest Act. Well, late on a Friday night, sure got busy in the Ottawa Bureau. Thanks, David. You're welcome, Matt. But, of course, Adrian, we're here because of Remembrance Day tomorrow, and we have more coverage to come from this city. Okay, we will definitely get back to you soon, Ian, but we have to turn now to a story that has gripped people around the world today and really for much of this week. That is the story of the searing new insights tonight into the sexual revelations that are shaking the entertainment business. 
From comic Louis C.K., a stunning admission of guilt. From actor Ellen Page, highly personal stories of emotional abuse and assault. This week, the human and financial costs seem to be mounting by the hour as we see more clearly than ever the Dream Factory's dark side. How do women still go out with guys when you consider the fact that there is no greater threat to women than men? Once revered for smashing social norms, today the comic confirmed he really did masturbate in front of young women. At the time, I said to myself that what I did was okay, he wrote. He rationalized that by saying he always asked them first if it was okay. But what I learned later in life, too late, is that when you have power over another person, doing that is a predicament for them. The power I had over these women is that they admired me and I wielded that power irresponsibly. Now, he didn't say the words, sorry, or I apologize in his statement, but apparently he did to some of the women directly. That's right. Several of the women did receive messages from him or spoke to him on the phone, and he expressed feeling sorry for the, his behavior. But, you know, one of the things that's interesting about this behavior is that it really hits deeply, and an apology is a great move to, to make, but, but it doesn't necessarily erase the, the pain or the trauma of the original experience. Well the damage and abuse of power can cause was made painfully clear today when Canadian actor Ellen Page took to Facebook. Dory, I'm here to help you. She wrote about an incident on the set of an X-Men movie. She says she was just 18 when director Brett Ratner invited an older woman to have sex with Page to make her realize she's gay. This public aggressive outing left me with long-standing feelings of shame, she wrote. Making someone feel ashamed of who they are is a cruel manipulation designed to oppress and repress. Page also described being harassed and assaulted. I want to see these men have to face what they've done, she wrote. I want them to not have power anymore. Now, last year, Louis C.K. earned an estimated $52 million U.S., more than half of that, from two Netflix specials. Today, Netflix called down his next special. FX cut him out of the four series he produced with the network, and his new film will not be released. Also this week, BBC cancelled a holiday movie starring actor Ed Westwick, who faces two allegations of rape. In the weeks since accusers went public against the producer, Harvey Weinstein, there are so many men under suspicion. Let's go through it. Producer James Toback, actors Kevin Spacey, Jeremy Piven, Charlie Sheen, Dustin Hoffman, Steven Seagal, comic Andy Dick, and magician David Blaine. Now, the sheer volume has forced the L.A. District Attorney to form a special task force of veteran prosecutors to investigate sexual abuse in the entertainment industry, and this reaches into Canada. Montreal police set up a hotline last month for reporting sexual assault in just a few weeks, 463 calls. Police have now opened 98 criminal investigations. In the political arena, an Alabama Republican stands accused of sexually preying on underage girls, but some supporters still rally around Roy Moore in his run for the Senate. A state official defended Moore by citing couples in the Bible with a big age difference, including Mary and Joseph. Lindsay Duncombe looked into why people are defending what seems indefensible. I believe in the Second Amendment. Long before this, there was this. That's then-Alabama Chief Justice Roy Moore personally installing a granite monument to the Ten Commandments in the courthouse. He lost his job, but became a populist hero to a faction of Alabama evangelicals. They applauded when, again Chief Justice, Moore defied the Supreme Court and refused to allow same-sex marriages. But defending him now? I'm working on 31 years and I still don't understand. <laughs> John Archibald is a longtime Alabama journalist. So many of Roy Moore's supporters are evangelicals. They're religious. So is it surprising to you that at least some of them are defending him in the face of these allegations? Uh, in, in some ways, it's stunning. Uh, and not everyone is, but there are a, sele a select few Roy Moore supporters who say, we don't care if these allegations are true. Part of it is the state of the country and the world in that our politics is so divided and divisive 
that many people, and we are the epicenter of this here in Alabama, I would say, um, tend to be uh, more obsessed with our political leanings than we are virtually anything else. And when we talk about this partisanship, we're not talking about the traditional Republican-Democratic divide. Many of them see this as sort of a conspiracy to, to defame more in 30 days before an election. And the, the question is whether it's a conspiracy orchestrated by Democrats or a conspiracy orchestrated by establishment Republicans. I keep smiling when I say this because it all seems so absurd, um, but it's true. What this controversy is sure to do, motivate partisans on both sides, making a controversial election even more so. Lindsay Duncombe, CBC News, Washington. To another big international story now, after a day of twists and turns, there was actually progress at the Trans-Pacific Partnership negotiations in Vietnam. The TPP would have profound effects on many parts of the Canadian economy, but it's also fraught with political maneuvering, and it is particularly tricky for Canada in the midst of trade negotiations with the U.S. Remember, President Trump pulled the U.S. out of the TPP back in January. Today, the 11 partner countries agreed on some of the core elements of the proposed deal. So the countries have agreed to standards on the environment and labor, but there are still some areas of contention. There is a lot of disagreement on rules affecting the auto sector. Intellectual property provisions have been suspended, and Canada wants to ensure the right of each country to preserve cultural policies. That, of course, a particular concern for Quebec. Now, word of that agreement came only after a really strange turn of events earlier in the day. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was a no-show for a key meeting, and for a while there, it looked like the whole deal had been thrown off the rails and that he was responsible. The international media didn't pull any punches. Screwed by Justin Trudeau, that's what this Australian headline screams, and that was echoed all over amid fears that Trudeau's no-show could mean no deal a for the other countries. A last-minute complaint from Canada killed off any chance of the TPP trade deal being sealed. As the leaders' meeting to officially sign the agreement was about to get underway, there was a sudden realisation. Canada wasn't there. It is true that Canada did not attend that meeting, uh, and uh, those talks have now been uh, postponed. The Prime Minister's office says this was just a scheduling misunderstanding. So, so let's just try to decode this with the help of Katie Simpson in Ottawa. What are we talking about here, Katie? A scheduling misunderstanding or some crafty political posturing? Well, the government is officially saying this was a scheduling issue, but with all that's happened over the past 24 hours, it sure looks like Canada is trying to get some strong messages across, both at home and abroad. Domestically, there are certain Canadian industries and labour leaders that are not happy about TPP. So in no way does it hurt the government to slow down the talks, given the blowback at home. The biggest concerns are coming from the auto sector, labour unions, the dairy industry, and the Canadian tech sector. So there are a wide wide range of issues and worries about this deal. Now, even though at the end of the day the Canadian government does want an agreement, the Canadian delegation is clearly making a point that it just won't accept any deal for the sake of accepting an agreement, and that does play well at home. Right, so they do have some reasons to worry, but I mean, politically, this is clearly a card for Canada, so how is it planning on using it? Well, on the international stage, it also sends a number of different messages. Uh, right now, Canada is in the middle of those difficult NAFTA talks, and the Canadians don't want to look weak or to be seen making undesirable compromises. Some analysts will argue about whether the Americans are paying much attention to TPP talks since Donald Trump did pull his country out of the deal, one of the first things he did when he took over as president. But China... China is watching. And remember, China is not included in TPP. If this deal is finalized quickly, the Trans-Pacific Partnership could be used as a template for how trade in the Asia-Pacific region works. Canada is deciding whether it wants to do free trade talks with China, so it is in Canada's interest to get Canadian values, Canadian demands etched into TPP as a starting point for future much larger agreements. Right, so it's a total tightrope. Mm -hmm. Katie Simpson in Ottawa, thank you, as always. Thanks. If you're wondering what is the TPP, let's back it up a bit. Here's a primer on the Pacific trade deal and how Canadian industries could be affected. 
on this issue of TPP-11. It's uh, something Canada is, of course, uh, very much uh, engaged in. TPP-11, that is the Trans-Pacific Partnership of 11 countries creating a free trade zone spanning from Chile to Vietnam. For Canada, the real price here would be unfettered access to Japan, the world's third largest economy. The big Canadian winner in the deal would be the agriculture industry, which says it has billions of dollars at stake. Beef and pork producers in particular expecting to export an additional $500 million worth of products to Japan. Canola exporters would stand to gain too, with duties eliminated over five years. For consumers, we can expect to see car prices drop over time. But there is give and take in trade deals always, and there's concern TPP will flood Canada with cheaper Asian vehicles, maybe hurting Canada's auto industry. When it comes to the auto sector, you bet it will take the time to consult with stakeholders to get the deal right. Lots more to come on The National tonight. I sat down with this year's Silver Cross mother. She'll tell you about her son and her family's long military tradition. We'll also tell you about how Canada's military is identifying the remains of soldiers lost long ago. And we're following other news too, including the latest technological twist in the fight against fentanyl. Will it make a difference? When I'm buying my drugs, I, I want to test it more because they, like, there's so many people dying that, uh, you know, it's, it's unmanageable. And over on the someplace else side, maybe you'll find you somebody else, which is plenty to worry about even if you happen to feel pretty good at the time. But you live in a town, any town, and you spend most of your time as if you know what it's all about. You know where you're going, when really you don't know, because it's the town that's going, and you're just along for the ride. We don't, we don't know, like even, you know, when they make um, jib, like I don't use it, but that's made out of st stuff just from underneath the counter, right? You know, like uh, it could be anything, uh, any cleaning stuff. So I would definitely want to know what's going into my body. That's Lorna Bird. She's 61 years old and uses cocaine every day. She has for almost 40 years now. But like many drug users across the country, every hit is a gamble because who knows what's really in there? Well, over the past couple of weeks, the province of British Columbia has quietly been rolling out a new piece of technology that it says could keep people like Lorna alive. Whether it'll actually work that way, though, still an open question. Let's show it to you first. It's a spectrometer, meaning it reads light and color. It's expensive, about $50,000, but it can tell a drug user whether what they're about to snort or inject is actually what they think it is. 
The province is trying it out at two supervised drug use sites in Vancouver. Drug checking is something that will give people the information that they need in order to make choices about how much to use and about whether to use. Now, I wanted to learn a bit more about what this device is actually capable of. So I got an up-close look with technician Ian Garber, the only person trained to use the device at the moment. But what I found out is that it can often produce unexpected results. Okay, Ian, so show me how it works. All right, so um, basically we just asked the client to place a very small amount of the sample uh, on the machine. About uh, that much is more than enough. Then we apply pressure to the sample with this anvil, and then uh, we start scanning the sample with infrared light. In a practical sense, what will this tell us? This machine will basically tell us what molecules are present in the sample, uh, whether that's a pure compound or a mixture of up to three or four different things. I would say out of the uh, tests we've done in the past couple of weeks, uh, as, we, as we start this pilot project, um, only about 5% of any of the samples um, that are supposed to be heroin have any heroin at all in them. So think about that. Rarely is a person's heroin actually heroin. But here's where things get even trickier, because we've learned that this machine isn't actually sensitive enough to detect fentanyl reliably. According to the technician, drugs are typically cut with such a small amount of the stuff that the machine wouldn't even pick it up. So they still need to use separate fentanyl test strips, the kind that have already been available for months. And do you know how much fentanyl is out there nationwide? Five years ago, less than 1% of heroin 2000. tested by Health Canada contained fentanyl. Now, that number is just over 60%. And if you look at all street drugs tested during that time, there's been a 2,000% increase. So, a question worth asking. How useful will this machine be that can't reliably detect small amounts of fentanyl in a province where fentanyl is among the deadliest drugs out there? Well, to be fair, this is a pilot project. BC wants to learn more about who will even bother to have their drugs tested and what they'll actually decide to do with those drugs depending on the test result. They also don't know if this will draw people in. Because remember, people usually die alone, not at the kind of place I visited today. So, this is just one step among many, many others in the face of a crisis that marches on and on. So let's talk solutions. Uh, we've got the federal health minister joining us right now, Jeanette Petipat taylor and, and Minister Taylor, you know, the, the federal government has done a lot, right? It's invested more than $100 million in this fight. It's paved the way to open more supervised injection sites. It's opened access to naloxone across the country. My, my question is, what else? What else can the federal government be doing here? Well, first of all, we have to recognize, our government recognizes that we are facing a serious public health crisis in this country right now, and we truly have to work collaboratively with all provinces, territories, and service providers and municipalities to ensure that we pull all stops. We really have to make sure that we work together in order to effectively deal with the crisis that's happening on the ground. So let's get concrete then. I mean, you call it a public health crisis. Uh, you've fallen short of calling it a public health crisis emergency. Is that something that could be coming down the pipe, which would open up resources across the nation? We've made it very clear over the past several months, I know since I've been health minister, that it is a national public health crisis. We are not calling it an emergency because really and truly it wouldn't provide me with any more levers or any more tools to work with on the ground. So we recognize this is a very serious situation. We recognize that we're, we're losing an awful lot of people and the collateral damage on the ground is huge for families, for friends and for service providers. Okay, so, so, so again, I guess the question is what more can we do? I mean, you know, we've spoken to a number of people who've started to think that maybe the way forward is to decriminalize drug use beyond marijuana. What's your answer to that? Our government has made it very clear that we have no intention uh, of decriminalizing drugs. Uh, or any more drugs at this time. Uh, what we are looking at, though, however, is to continuing to work together cl in close collaboration with all levels of government. So, so, so the question is, I mean, at what point does the federal government say, look, things have gotten so bad, we need to do something drastic beyond simply continuing what we're doing? 
Again, when I was named health minister last month, um, I was able to go to Vancouver, actually, and go visit the downtown east side just to see exactly what was happening there. I met with individuals that were um, living with uh, substance use issues. I also met with many service providers and also met with many police officers and frontline interveners to get a real picture of exactly what was going on down there. Again, as indicated, we recognize that there's no one solution to effectively deal with this, but we do know we really have to work together. We have to do all that we can to put our energies forward in order to effectively deal with this situation. Because when we lose one life, we also recognize that it's affecting many families, many communities. And the more that we can do to deal with this, the better that it's going to be. Okay, uh, we do have to leave it there. Minister Taylor, thanks for taking the time. Thank you. And Ian, I'll hand things back over to you. I, I know from your reporting on this subject that there are a lot of people who are frustrated and wondering what more the federal government would be willing to do if the status quo continues. I guess that's still a, an ongoing question. And, you know, after our coverage yesterday, I got a lot of tweets and emails, and people are so divided on the issue of legalizing heroin and cocaine. But one thing is beyond dispute. A lot of people are dying, specifically in British Columbia. And so if uh, those lives matter, uh, governments are going to have to try to come up with uh, some different strategies of some sort. Okay, thanks, okay. Andrew. Uh, tomorrow, Rosemary and I are going to be covering the Remembrance Day ceremony here in Ottawa. But Canada's war dead are being remembered overseas as well, including in Belgium where they marked a defining moment in Canadian history. This torchlight procession traced the final route of the muddy First World War battle of Passchendaele. It was 100 years ago today that that battle ended. Like Vimy Ridge, Canada showed what it could do, but at a great cost. 4,000 Canadians died taking the village back. For some, Remembrance Day is literal. They only have a memory of a loved one killed in service. When we come back, you will meet the Canadians digging up the past to try to give those families closure. We found his boots. We found a bayonet. For me personally, I find it's important because um, it returns their identity to them. They're no longer missing. They're no longer faceless. They're no longer nameless. Morning Glory did its work. The gully was overrun. The way lay open to Ortona. Into this town, the Germans fell back. And these were Germans of the 1st Parachute Division. The town would be defended. The worst was still ahead. We used to say, and it was true, that the German was a good soldier. But then as soon as our chap got on top of him, he gave up. That's not true here. Here we fight till we kill them. They are Germans, but I admire their guts. I'll say this. I'm very proud because my men are better than the Germans here. Remember, we attack. They defend. But how they defend. I spent several hours in Ortona. If it wasn't hell, it was the courtyard of hell. It was a maelstrom of noise and hot, splitting steel. Our tanks in the square seemed to be ripping the town to pieces. And the enemy's anti-tank shells and mortars were crashing into the buildings everywhere. still in Ortona when it was Christmas. From the killing, the men withdrew by turn to celebrate the day. streets immediate.
called it Little Stalingrad, and from their experience here would instruct the Allied armies on the craft of street fighting. This is Peter Sturzberg of the CBC reporting from the Italian front. For the dead of Ortona, the bell of its cathedral, the Cathedral of St. Thomas the Apostle tolls. For the Canadians who died in taking the town, and for the dust and ashes of the cathedral itself, the bell tolls. The soldiers of Canada would move on to fight again. For those whose home had been Ortona, the ordeal of war at last was over. That is the tomb of the unknown soldier right by the National War Memorial in Ottawa. Interred there are remains of a soldier who has never been identified. Not too far from where we are, there are people dedicated to putting faces and names to those lost soldiers. Nala Ayed met a team digging into the unknown to bring life to those who gave it so many years ago. On the hopeful horizon so of old this... battlefields, the inevitable invasion of progress. They are warriors of the future, making inroads where there were once trenches. Moving on, as inevitably we always try to do, even after devastating war. And yet, just as inevitably, the pull of the past here in France is just as hard to repel. Well, they brought up lots of machine guns and especially artillery. It brings thousands here, keen to unearth history and the memories of the missing. You only have to visit some of the war graves here to appreciate just how many soldiers died in anonymity. It's believed some 27,000 Canadians are still missing in action with no known grave. The legacy of two world wars and the full-time preoccupation of one woman. Sarah Lockyer comes to France twice a year, a forensic anthropologist from Ottawa's tiny casualty identification program. Her office here is the Commonwealth War Graves Commission. Her job is to pull the past into the present and identify fallen soldiers they still find here to this day. For me personally, I find it's important because um, it returns their identity to them. They're no longer missing. They're no longer faceless. They're no longer nameless. We were not allowed to film the soldiers' remains, so Lockyer used a plastic model to explain what she does. I lay everything out in anatomical order, because then I'm able to see, do I have any duplicates? And what morphological markers that I can look at that will help me get an age and sex? The one that I, when I have it, I get really excited about, is the sternal end of the clavicle here. Mm. That one is the last one to fuse in the entire body. So that allows, sort of gives me an idea of over 30, under 30. One find near the newly built prison came with crucial clues. We found these boots. We found a bayonet. So there's a button here, which thankfully was quite legible. So there's Canadian Scottish mm -hmm. that you can read all the way around, 16th Battalion at the very top. Every story starts with a phone call to the War Graves Commission. Within 15 minutes, a team is on the way. 
Last year in June, Steve Arnold got a call when crews building this parking lot made a discovery. The rough position was, was here, I would imagine, which was which is right on the on the on the on the front line, really, right on the on the German this trench. Will the front line. This will also be returned to the family as a, a person. They had found a lot: a toothbrush, the toothpaste. The remains and an unusual number of artifacts were remarkably well preserved. For an investigator, it was gold. This was found on his finger mm -hmm. and is what's called a singet ring. So it has his initials on it, HWS. It is incredible what shape this is in. That came out of the ground exactly like that. We did not clean that. So for us, we were lucky because we also found an identification disc. So. This now has some corrosion, has some damage on it, but you can clearly read SGT, mm -hmm. um, HW, yeah. and CATH for Catholic down oh. at the bottom. You do have to sort of put up that wall, I guess, to, to make sure that you just, you do view them just as individual cases to be able to get the work done. The hard work in solving the puzzle begins back in Ottawa at the Casualty Identification Unit, looking at old maps, the battles, and the units involved where the remains were found. Names of every soldier that died. Then it's to casualty lists, and then war records to compare Lockyer's measurements. Once an identity is confirmed, it's every possible means to find next of kin. Then they make a phone call that can change lives. So they were hoping, simply by taking Hill 70, it would convince the Germans to, to evacuate long. In an overgrown battlefield in France, they're learning about the Battle of Hill 70, a little-known Canadian-led offensive against German forces a hundred years later. 16th Battalion, to their right. Good stories. Jack Kennedy is a history teacher from Boston, whose Canadian great-uncle died in the battle. One day, Kennedy got a phone call suggesting his uncle had been found. He was sure it was a hoax. There was a part of me that was a little bit cynical that was waiting for, okay, now this is going to happen. You know, you need to make a down payment on a flight to Paris. Please forward us a check for... Uh, and we're kind of waiting for that other shoe to drop. The war drivers. Lorraine Lenya came from Manitoba to trace her great uncle's final days, all of 22 when he was killed, also in the Battle of Hill 70. No one really talked about it. I knew there was a picture there. All I knew it was a soldier on the wall, and, uh, and I don't think we ever knew what a soldier really did in those days. All that's left is that picture and a letter that broke the news of his death. Killed in action on August 15th, 1917, when it is possible a cross will be erected in his memory. In the interim, she kept her uncle's memory alive. So when a phone call came asking her to donate DNA to help identify an unknown soldier, she didn't hesitate. I said, by all means, if it's going to help. But I said, after 100 years, I said, uh, you know, how is it possible? But with science the way it is, anything's possible now, I guess, so. In the mail, she got one of these to collect a DNA sample. Here, it's purified and analyzed to create a genetic profile that can then be compared to a possible relative. The results in Leniak's case allowed the ID process to proceed to the final step. The review board is the final hurdle, and they have to be unanimous. In Leniak's case, it didn't take long, and Lockyer called her that afternoon. And now he just said, we confirmed that the remains of interest are, in fact, Reginald Joseph Winfield Johnston. Thank you, I said, for all your work. And I said, what a great Christmas present. At the Commonwealth War Graves Commission, this is the ultimate aim, to always put names to the headstones as soldiers are laid to rest. Major Harold Shaughnessy and Private Reginald Johnston now have their own. 
etched with their names and a few words chosen by family. They will be buried with the boots in which they served. Does everybody have a hand to hold? The families now on their own extraordinary journey to the same places, but looking very different now. It's emotionally difficult to Ray to walk in the footsteps of family near Hill 70. Johnston would have been 300 yards or more that way. Where Johnston fell near what is now a prison, or that parking lot where Shaughnessy died at the front line. My mother and my aunt, who would have been his nieces, uh, would be so excited about this. Here is the identification disc. Part of the experience, the overwhelming surprise of inheriting their uncle's belongings. Oh my God, imagine. <laughs> Some coins. And if you're wondering, it's exactly why Lockyer wears those glasses. Little metal cup. I wonder. <laughs> Hello. Thank you. Nearly 100 years later to the day, their turn had finally come. And that promise to hold a proper burial, when it is possible, had been kept. They had to be here. It was my duty. Now we know where he is and what happened to him, and he's being buried with uh, his company and uh, with great respect and dignity. And that's, that's important. Canada cares. You know, and the fact that after 100 years, Canada could turn around and go to these particular lengths to put this together, I thought was incredibly impressive. And intensely personal to Lockyer too. Her own grandfather fought in the Second World War. Her regret, not asking him more questions. She now finds joy in providing answers. We get to affect the Canadian military's history, Canada's history, and then individual families, their personal histories as well. So that's kind of, uh, and as you can tell, I'm starting to get a little emotional with that, but it's, it's huge, it's huge. Nala Ayed, CBC News, Los Ancoel, France. Well, tomorrow this year's Silver Cross Mother will lay a wreath behind me in memory of all the mothers who lost children in service of this country. I spoke with her a few days ago about her dad who served in the Second World War and about her son who served in Somalia but never came back. To find out that uh, it was an accident, uh, that was the hard part. To find out that his best friend uh, had had an accident with his gunman, and he was dead, and he wasn't going to be coming home. The world wars, Korea, Vietnam, wars far removed from Canada's first peoples, white man's battles, some said, on battlefields in foreign lands. But the wars reached into Indian, Inuit, and Métis homes across the country. Aboriginal men and women volunteered in the thousands. Many sacrificed their Indian status to do so. Many sacrificed their lives. Over 6,000 Aboriginal people joined the armed forces during World War II. For many, the threat of Nazism expanding to this country seemed very, very real. 
But even while they were fighting fascism on the front lines, Aboriginal soldiers were fighting racism at home. Harry and Teresa both grew up in the prairies, both in Métis settlements on the fringes of white society. The Métis knew about battles. Their enemies were poverty, tuberculosis, and indifference. We get up at 6 o'clock in the morning and go to bed at uh, whenever the sun goes down just to make a living, just to put food on the table. There was no, no, no money involved. There was nothing. There was, no, there was nothing there for us. I come home crying once. I told my mother, and, and uh, she says, what's the matter with you, you know? And uh, I says, well, they beat me up outside. They, they're after me. And she says, what for? I says, well, they call me dirty, stinking Indian. And he says, go on away, you know. You tell them kids over there that your great-grandfather was pure white, you know. While Canada ignored Aboriginal calls for help, the Aboriginal people answered Canada's. Some were thirsty for adventure. Some felt a duty to defend the Queen who had signed their treaties. Others wanted three square meals a day. Our uh, whole community enlisted all the guys were gone and there was not very many young people left and the older guys went too I mean the married people went I mean, our community was devastated my father says well he says you're a man you're a soldier you're fighting for your country and that's the words that he said and he dug in his pocket and pulled out 52 cents put it on the table. He says, now go and get a bottle of Catawba wine. <laughs> For 18-year-old Harry, whose father Joseph was a World War I vet, the war brought the first taste of alcohol and the first taste of equality. This is the first time in my life I had any clothes that I could talk about. So, and I, they give me boots, and they give me soap, and they give me a towel, and all them things that, uh, that help us every day. Teresa's brother, George Dion, enlisted immediately. When Teresa signed up, 18 years old, she didn't want anyone to know she was Métis. If you um, told anybody you were Métis that you weren't accepted into their circle, and we always strive to be accepted, of course. Teresa served in the Women's Corps, posted in Alberta. Harry went overseas, spent two years in England. It really is interesting to see how those photos come to life. It's just one of hundreds of photos from the First World War that the Vimy Foundation recently colorized. You can see more from the collection at our website. Tomorrow's ceremony will take place right behind me, and Silver Cross mother Diana Abel will lay a wreath at the memorial, representing all the mothers who have lost a child in service. Abel lost her son in Somalia during one of Canada's most controversial peacekeeping missions. We sat down in her home in Brampton, Ontario, to remember her son, Michael. The most important thing in here is the flag. This flew over the base in Somalia, mm -hmm. and it was presented to me at my son's funeral. Um, so that means a lot to me. It's very tattered, mm -hmm. torn. I always said that they would never choose me because of the Somalia incident. 
Good evening. There was a barrage of questions today about the conduct of Canadian peacekeepers in Somalia. Opposition MPs say it is clear the operation is in crisis. Since February, four Somalis have been killed by Canadians, and two of those deaths are being investigated as homicides. Much of their work was superb. They saved thousands. And yet the scandals were some of the most serious and ugliest in our recent military history. And many who served there returned embittered. And what should Canadians know about the Somalia mission? They did their job. They did their job under very difficult circumstances. And, and my son's job with three commando, they were at the airport. They were to make sure that the planes could land with the food because it was a humanitarian mission as well. Um, so they had to get the food from there to Bella Twain, which they did. That picture of your son with the kids mm -hmm. in Somalia, they look, everybody, they look happy. Oh yeah. Well, he, <laughs> he used to give them things. He used to send things to them. And, like what? Oh, candy and cookies and different things like that. Um, the last box I sent him was, was t-shirts that never got to him, but that was for the kids. And to find out that uh, it was an accident, uh, that was the hard part. To find out that his best friend uh, had had an accident with his gun and, and he was dead and he wasn't going to be coming home. He, he, he loved lots of things. He, um, like I say, he loved history and that. He didn't come home um, during r and &R from Somalia. He went to see all the sites for the Vimy and, and all that. Um, he loved cars. He loved his motorcycle. He had a big Harley, fat boy. He loved that. He liked the independence of it and he liked the open, open road. My grandson, John, who's going to be escorting me on, set, on November the 11th. Mm -hmm. He's the spitting image of, of, my, um, of Michael, and he wants to join. He, he's applying to RMC, and uh, he'd like to join the military as well. So, so many generations of your family have served under so many different circumstances. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about the prospect of now your grandson being in the military? Scary. Scary, yeah. My father went off to World War II. Uh, my husband was peacetime, but uh, you know, it, it, it's a sense of pride, I think, to think that the family business, he's going into the family business. As people look at you on November the 11th in Ottawa, as they see you as the Silver Cross mother carrying out your duties, what, what should they be thinking? They should be thinking that these young men and women put their lives on the line for Canada. And uh, they do their job. They do the best that they can under sometimes very difficult circumstances, but they do their job. I enjoyed so much of that conversation, but in particular that phrase that she used that her father, her husband and her son, and probably her grandson as well, all part of the, the family business. We'll tell you how you can take part in CBC News Remembrance Day coverage on television and online just ahead on The National. It pleases me to be here. Give this award to Gordon. I've known Gordon for a long time. And uh, I know he's been offered this award before, but he has never accepted it because uh, he wanted me to come and give it to him. So, uh, anyway, he's somebody of uh, rare talent and all that. And here's a video clip now of his uh, recent and not so recent achievements. Right now, we're delighted to welcome to our show our very good friend, the fabulous Gordon Lightfoot. I don't believe the railroad men do rest 
Okay. All right, here it is. One grateful guy from Marilla. On the national tonight, a dramatic twist in a triple murder case in Alberta. A judge has thrown out key parts of an accused killer's confessions because he was denied a bathroom break multiple times during an interrogation. Joshua Frank is one of two men accused of killing three people back in 2013. But the judge ruled today there's a chance the only reason he confessed on tape was so he could go and relieve himself. If you set out to make somebody's life miserable, if you make that your goal in life, you stand a really good chance of going to jail. That's exactly what one BC man found out today. Patrick Fox was sentenced to nearly four years in prison for harassing his ex-wife online. The court heard that he tormented her with threatening emails. He also set up a website in her name, labeling her a white supremacist and a drug addict. This was one of the first Canadian attempts to use the criminal harassment charge to counter online attacks. And something else we're watching tonight, problems with that new iPhone with the big price tag. Apple is admitting that its latest product, the iPhone X, may freeze up in cold weather. The phone officially went on sale last week. Apple says it thinks it's a software issue, and it's working on a fix. So just a couple of the headlines. Uh, the other headlines out there, but Ian, I want to throw things back to you in Ottawa because we're looking at the day to come. It is going to be a, a busy and, and poignant weekend. For you and it certainly will. And, you know, this weekend right across the country, of course, people will be gathering to uh, commemorate those who died and fought in wars. And, and for many, it's a deeply personal reminder of the sacrifice that their own family members made. Canadian actor R.H. Thompson is telling the story of his granduncle who was killed in the Battle of Passchendaele exactly 100 years ago. So this is my family. These are all my great uncles. Five go to fight in World War I. Four of these great uncles didn't make it. Two died here from gas, and two were killed in Belgium and France. This is George, and he was 24, and I know that he was killed at Passchendaele, and he was never found. So where's the body? It is a terrific documentary, and you can watch it tomorrow on CBC News Network at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Time. As for tomorrow's ceremonies, Rosemary Barton and I will be right here in Ottawa, just in front of the National War Memorial. We'll bring you the events live. That begins at 10 a.m. on CBC Television. You can also live stream the event at cbcnews.ca. That is the national for this November 10th. Uh, it is cold here, by the way, in Ottawa tonight. <laughs> Good night. A little warmer in Vancouver tonight. <laughs>